true church, universal and apostolic, whose holy faith let us reverently and sincerely declare by the use of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Is it still not up? No? Oh, okay. Well, praise the Lord. As Dr. Mitchell says, those on the scene and those on the screen. <laughs> Let me pull up the correct announcements. Here are our announcements for this week. Quarterly conference will be this Thursday, April 18th, 7 p.m. It will be in person at the FLC. All officers are expected to attend. If you are unable to attend, please let me know so that I can pass that information on to the presiding elder. On next Sunday, uh, at 3 p.m., we have been invited to the Neely's Grove AME Zion Church in Gastonia, where a son of East Stonewall, the Reverend Rodney Courtney, is the pastor. He has invited us to come and celebrate with them for their friends and family day. And we are all invited. Um, and so I look forward to those that can come, those that will come, um, and also an accompaniment of choir. 
And then the following Sunday, the 28th, uh, the Zion Chapel AME Zion Church in Hidden Night, North Carolina, is celebrating their sesquicentennial, mm -hmm. their 150th uh, church celebration or anniversary at 3 p.m. As I said last week, they asked first. Mm -hmm. Rodney, oh, I'm sorry, Reverend Courtney uh, called a few weeks ago. And uh, so I, I would really like for us to be uh, as much of support as can, we can to uh, the Ch uh, Zion Chapel, AME Zion Church. Mm -hmm. um, if we need to carpool, we can carpool. They do want a head count, though so that they are sure that they can accommodate us fully, that they have enough vittles to feed us. Um, so I would need a head count for the choir, a head count for those who think they'll be able to come. And with us having more daylight, it should make it a little easier for us. Amen. We continue to prepare ourselves for our back to school uh, drive. And if you would like to participate, you can see uh, Mr. Roland Forbes. Uh, if you have been on uh, Facebook, uh, I'm sure you may have seen the advertisement for an exclusive interview that is, will be broadcasting on tomorrow night on AMEZ TV. Um, we have shared it. I have shared it personally. I think we've also shared it <clears throat> from the East Stonewall page. Um, but it is highlighting uh, our very own Coach Wilkes. And um, they were able to do get it filmed. And so that interview will air live on um, AMEZ TV on tomorrow. I think it's 8 p.m. Thank you. At 8 p.m. Uh, if you would, tune in. It'll be, um, uh, it was great, uh, a great interview, great information about family, faith, and football. And so um, it was just a blessing to be able to be here to hear it. Finally, um, I do have one last announcement. Some of you may have seen a post that I have shared regarding this announcement, and that is on Thursday, May 2nd, I have been asked and invited by the president, the Reverend uh, Dr. Lester uh, A. McCorn, to be the baccalaureate speaker for the Clinton College in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And so on that day, um, I don't need any accompaniment or anything for that, but on that day, I, I will be in Rock Hill. It is open to anyone that wants to attend, but as they are preparing, the very next day is their graduation. And so um, just pray for me, pray for me, pray for me that the Lord will give me what the Lord wants to be said. Amen. Amen. And that this 52-year-old uh, will be able to say something to those 22-year-olds who are graduating that it will be uh, inspirational and motivational as they get ready to go out into this current world. Amen. Um, that will uh, get their creative juices flowing and get them excited about what is to come. Um, I don't have any visitors' cards uh, that have been given to me, but do we have any visitors with us this morning that would like to be recognized? If not, good. amen, amen. Good morning, sir. Amen. Any others? Oh, I have one other announcement. Miss. Miss Camille Duncan, the granddaughter of Mr. Curl and Miss Sylvia Sims, was crowned Queen of Charlotte. I think I'm missing something here. Yeah, the Delta debutante, but there's something written here that I, I can't make out. But um, for the Charlotte alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta, uh, in their 60th debutante ball, at, uh, she is a senior at West Charlotte High School. So we say congratulations, Camille. Amen. We do know that we got some of our members, they got their AKAs in town this weekend, this week. 
They, I had already been told, Mr. Asbury told me straight up, Pastor, you know I ain't going to be there Sunday. I said, I never goes without saying. I know I ain't going to see you. But um, to getting back to our visitor, uh, we say welcome. Amen. Uh, we believe that you could have gone anywhere. And, and because God led you here, we believe that there's something that God wants you to get from your experience with us. And so whether it's a song to be sung, a scripture to be read, the word to be preached, a smile on someone's face, a hug, whatever it is that God sent you here to get, we believe that you will get it. And if it happens to be a church home, we say welcome home. We would love to be a church family. I would love to be your pastor. But if you're merely passing through, may the peace and grace of God go with you that you might have a blessed week. Amen. Amen. East Stone Wall. East Stone Wall. Let's have church up in here. The sun S U N is out, but the sun S O N is always out. We give God glory. Let's have church. Amen. Amen. Our scripture this morning will be read by the Reverend Campbell. Let the church say amen. amen. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Our scripture for this morning comes from the New, the New Testament book of the Holy Scriptures, the book of John, chapter 21, and I will be reading for all of our hearing this morning, verses 1 through 14. John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, and I will be reading from the King James Version. Well, we have it on the screen. Thank you. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of the fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, and there were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many the net was torn, was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have some breakfast. None of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Verse 14. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples 
after he was raised from the dead. God's holy word for God's holy people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our wise, holy, and unchanging God. Here we are once again. A few of your children gathered in this space called sanctuary. Coming, God, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. And as a part of our worship, God, the first thing we want to say to you is thank you. Thank you for being God all by yourself. Thank you, oh God, for watching over us while we slumbered and slept on last evening. Thank you, God, that while we dwelled in the abyss of darkness, our beds did not become our cooling boards, neither our sheets, our winding cloth. But early this morning, you woke us with your finger of love because you knew you still had work for us on this journey. And for that, we are grateful. Thank you, oh God, that we were able to prepare ourselves and either get dressed or be dressed to be in the house this morning. And, 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 and maybe, maybe, maybe there are those that are joining us virtually and and because they couldn't get dressed or be dressed, Lord, we thank you that they have the ability to connect virtually. For you declared unto us that whatever state that we find ourselves in, we've got to learn how to be content. Whether we are full or empty, whether we have a lot or we have nothing, whether we are rich or poor, we've got to learn how to be grateful and thankful in all things, that in everything we give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. So whether we are in this building or in our own buildings called home or in our cars or in a hotel or wherever we find ourselves this morning, God, we lift up holy hands and give you the praise. We praise you, O oh God. Because we realize that we don't deserve your grace, your mercy, or your favor. 
But because of your goodness, because of who you are, and in spite of who we are, you give it anyway. Lord, we are grateful. And now, God, now that we know we have it and we can live in it and operate in it, God, we ask that you would make us an instrument of your grace. Use us, Lord, that you might get the glory out of everything we say and do. Use us, Lord, that our lives will be an example of who you are. Use us, Lord. That whatever we say, whatever we do, however we act will be a direct reflection of who you are in our lives. Help us to be Christ-like. To live according to the example that he left us here. That we could read about, but more importantly, that the Holy Spirit in us can bring alive and renew in us every day of our lives. Now, God, we're asking that you would be with those of our church family who are sick this morning, those who desire to be in the building but can't, those who are on their beds of affliction, those who are battling diagnoses and disease in their bodies. Those who are recovering from surgery. Lord, we ask that you would be with them. We thank you, God, for what you've already done in their lives. For how you've already shown yourself strong. How you've already moved and brought them through valleys and over mountains, God. How you've already done the impossible. God, we thank you for that. But we have so much faith in you, God, that we're going to keep praising you for their full recovery in Jesus' name. Brother James Weathers, we praise you for his full recovery in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sister Yvonne McRae, God, we praise you for her full recovery in Jesus' name. Sister Wanda Hooper, God, we thank you for her full recovery in Jesus' name. Those who are still grieving loved ones like Sister Jacqueline Link, God, we are thanking you for healing hurt places in Jesus' name. God, for any and all of us who are still recovering from trauma, we thank you for the healing. Hallelujah. 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 Continue, oh God, to heal, deliver, and set free. If their names I haven't called, God, you, you know who they are. I meet them at the point of their needs, Sister Helen Price. If their names I haven't called, dear Lord, you know who they are. Go and find them and operate in them, through them, about them, around them, right where they are. Let them know that this morning their church family had them on their mind. Not just for us, God, but for our community, our city, our state, and our nation. Lord, if we named it all, we'll be here all day. So, God, we're going to allow our spirits to have intercession on our behalves with moanings and groanings that the enemy can't interpret. And when you and the Spirit gets to get together on our behalf, God, we, we know that there will be miracles, signs, and wonders uh, that will first take place in the atmosphere, but will meet us here on earth. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. For what you're doing. Thank you. We thank you for Brother Asbury who had a procedure this week. And now, God, as we leave or prepare, God, to end this prayer, we know we don't end your presence. We ask, oh, God, that you'll keep doing what you've been doing. 
in and among us. Dwell, God. Continue, continue to dwell in this place that as we prepare our hearts and minds for the preached word, you dwell. Open us, God, so we can receive what you have for us. You do a work. You do a work because if you do the work, God, we'll know it'll be done right. We thank you. We love you. We worship you. We adore you. We say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. None above you. Yeah, God, we ask it all. We say it all. We command it all in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, who is our Christ. We do pray and we give thanks. Hallelujah and amen. Amen. And amen.
past two weeks, I went to two home goings. My brothers in their 60s. But they didn't live a life in vain. They knew the Lord. I traveled to Maryland. Thank God brought me home safely. Then I went to New Bern yesterday. Two of my brothers, Aggie brothers, Alpha brothers. But I'm so glad that they had accepted Christ in their life. Church, it's time. It's time to stop playing church. And I'm going to stop. But this thing is real. Time is winding down. And you need that transfusion in your life to give you new life. The blood of Jesus. For the blood. In my soul, him of his Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your blood. For it's by your blood that we have been redeemed. Bought with the price. For you, Jesus, you have saved and claimed and cleaned our whole lives. So if anybody asks you just who I am, tell them I've been redeemed. But it was only by the blood of the Lamb. So God, we thank you for the cleansing blood that washed away all our sins, past, present, and future. And God, I pray that if there's anybody under the sound of my voice, whether in person or virtually, who's doubting whether or not the blood still works. Doubting whether or not the blood can make them whole. Questioning whether it has really washed away their sin. God, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would touch their heart. Cause them, oh God, to cry out, I yield. How can I be saved? How can I be delivered? How can I be changed? Or how can I be restored and renewed? But we accept you at your word. Now, God, as we have worshiped and praised you, now we have come to the moment of your preached word, and we ask that you would speak to me and through me that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. took us back to the scripture that we read last week, and I am using the New Living Translation, because at the end of the service and the day, God said, go back. So here we are, not necessarily with points, but I just have a few more things to point out from this word. John 21, beginning at verse 1, in the New Living Translation, here's what it says. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples 
beside the Sea of Galilee. And this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples, and two other disciples. And Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. And he called out, fellas, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because it was so many fish in it. And then the disciple whom Jesus loves, they, they have accredited this disciple to being John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work. Now you got to understand Peter was naked or scantily clothed. Jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the load, the loaded net to the shore. For they, for they were only about 300 yards. I'm sorry, only about 100 yards from the shore. And when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've caught, Jesus said. Simon Peter went abroad and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net had not broken. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared ask, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and fish. That was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. We're going to stick with the same subject, life after trauma, part two. Life After Trauma, part two. On last week, we set the stage for this sermon and shared about life after trauma, asserting that trauma changes us. Whether the trauma is acute, a one-time thing that happened, chronic, something repeated and prolonged that happens over and over and over again, over extended period of time, like some type of abuse, whether it's of a child or of a mate, and then complex trauma, whereby there are multiple and varied types of trauma happening to an individual all at the same time. For instance, those now in Gaza are, are facing the trauma of war and starvation over a long period of time and abandonment. Many have lost their parents and families. And, and so you have a multiple traumas happening all at once. And, and we said that trauma, yes, is it causes deep distress and emotional shock and physical and psychological injury, but trauma affects our brains and, and even can change the mapping of our brains and how we think. When people face trauma, they don't think straight. And what may seem simple, just move. Just leave to the outside world. It's not so simple to them. And so whether it's a global pandemic, starvation, a war-torn city or country, gang wars, whatever the trauma may be, the more prolonged the trauma is, the more it can change our thinking and change our living and change our experience and the mapping of our brain and thoughts. And, and sometimes it's hard for us to learn the lessons resulting from trauma. 
Uh, sim simply, 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 uh, take for instance the pandemic. I believe that God was warning us years before he ever allowed the pandemic to come. How, Pastor? Well, uh, well here you go. God, God, God was saying, listen, I, I allowed uncontrollable fires to consume uh, lands and trees and even some firefighters, but you wouldn't listen. I allowed the fire in a rainforest that, 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 that took up 70 or that provided 70% of the world's oxygen. I allowed a fire over there that, that burnt up the rainforest, but, but y'all didn't listen. I allow locusts to your fields and I let earth quake over various cities across the world, but, but, but we didn't listen. I allow the seasons to get confused and the earth to increase its heat, but we didn't listen. I allow sharks to invade your coast and I confuse the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and every creepy crawly thing upon the earth, but we didn't listen. I allow the heavens at times to be shut up and refuse to allow the clouds to cry rain. But we didn't listen because my people yet who are called by my name did not humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways so that I could hear from heaven forgive their sin and heal their land. So God says now it's necessary that I shut it all down. If I want my world, my earth renewed and replenished, I got to put all of you in the house. I got to put you all on house arrest. And it wasn't until that moment that we started to see clear skies over China again. Clear skies over, over, over cities that had nothing but smog in the air. Whereby we could breathe fresh air again. But we are right back. In many regards where we were before, God was looking for humility out of us, out of humanity. And, and, and we, he'll get it for a little while as long as we were on lockdown, everybody running around trying to feed, see what they could do. The church finally realized it and, and, and said we got to get back to the first church, our house, and began to do what was needed. And, and, and all of a sudden that stopped. So whether living in Gaza or Haiti or Ukraine, and now Israel and Iran fighting. Last week, we talked about, and even today, looking at how life after trauma affects us or can affect us. The disciples, as we said last week, were trying to figure out how to live their life after the traumatic death of Jesus the state-sanctioned lynching of their savior. And that trauma had so rocked their world because they had assumed that he was going to be the one to free them from the tyranny of government overreach who had come in and occupied their land, took over what belonged to them and their ancestors. And they wanted their land back. They understood that God promised them a Davidic king upon the throne at all times. And God promised them you're going to get it back. But what they didn't understand is that God had moved now from the natural to the spiritual realm. Because as God was trying to handle this business on the natural, so many uh, of those he had put in leadership as kings got compromised. And, and when they got compromised, they became greedy and, 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 and took advantage of the people testing one, two, three. How many of our world leaders today get compromised? How, how many, how many, how many third world countries are, ain't as poor as we want to think they are because, because the leaders of those nations got more than they can use, but the poor folk ain't got food to eat because they've been corrupt and compromised. So they've taken over their land and what? They wanted was Jesus to show a show of force on the earth to take back their property. Especially one like Peter, who was a zealot. Zealots were zeal, had zeal for the Lord. They, 
they, they were the anti-government faction of the Jewish party <laughs> of Judaism. They, they were the ones that were going to take up the sword as is evidenced by Peter cutting off the ear of the high priest's uh, uh, servant when they came to arrest Jesus. Uh, T Peter was a part of that, that, that group that would gang bang in a minute. Peter didn't care. He going to throw hands. That's what Peter going to do. He going to cuss you out. Then he going to throw hands. See, we got to understand, you got to have a whole lot of folk on your team. We be running around, wanting everybody on the team to pray. You better have somebody watching. God said to watch and pray. If everybody head down praying, who watching? Who holding? <laughs> who packing? See, I have to know who packing in my church where I stand. I got to know who packing and where they sitting. I got to know I'm covered. If a fool walk up in here, who packing? Okay, okay, okay. Concealed or not, yeah. Concealed. <laughs> Better have somebody packing on your team. Yeah. Jesus understood he needed some of everybody. Mm -hmm. He needed some prayers and some packers. Right. <laughs> he made sure his team was balanced. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> and so the disciples, having seen Jesus twice in the upper room, uh, now are in Galilee, which is where Jesus told them to go, and he said, I'll meet you there. And, and, and there, is, there is conversation about whether, uh, about why they went fishing, and you know, uh, they just need to pass the time, or maybe they were hungry, and so they just went to go get some food. But I, I, I want to think in my mind, in my sanctified mind, they went because of what I said on last week. They went because when you're in trauma, you long for normalcy. When we were in the trauma of the pandemic, we longed for things to get back to normal. Can we get normal again? But on last week, we confirmed that there is no normal in God. The only thing that is normal is God. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forevermore. But everything else is subject to change. And as long as we hold to God's unchanging hand, we can know that no matter what we go through and deal with, we're going to be all right. God doesn't change, but in every generation, God changes the method. God changes the way. He changes how we minister. God gives us opportunity to make change. Because we have to if we're going to succeed as time progresses. So the thing that we want whenever we are in trauma is normalcy. So they ran to what was normal and familiar. For Peter, it was fishing because that's where Jesus found him. Fishing. And he said, I will make you fishers of men. So they dropped their nets and they followed him. Same with James and John, sons of Zebedee. They were fishing with their daddy and their daddy's business. And same invitation he gave them. And, 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 and they followed. And Nathaniel, his cousin Andrew, I think it was, went to get him and said, I think we done found the Lord. He's one that came from Nazareth and Nathaniel sitting under the tree with his, uh, 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 I want to say, no, I ain't going to say that. <laughs> with his cynic cynicism, with his cynicism, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Notice now the people that they named, they named, who did they name that went? They named Peter Thomas and they named Nathaniel Thomas, who we know is called the twin. Thomas, the one who was not there when the Lord first stepped in to them at the upper room, which meant Jesus came back a second time after his resurrection to show himself to Thomas. And so we, we, we affirm that after trauma, after pain, Betty Wright says, that we want to uh, uh, have normalcy. And last week we said the first thing is we want to, there's a temptation to go back 
But, but we said no matter what you try, no matter what you do, going back, it still won't be the same. You can duplicate your steps. You can have the same rhythm, the same song, but the dance still going to be different. Right. Why? Because you've gone through something now. You've experienced something that you can't take away. And because of that experience, even what you ex even the new thing you go through or trying to recreate the old thing is going to be different because now you have new knowledge and new experience. And trying to recreate the old it will come up empty. We also said in that section that God, if you look through scripture, God never did stuff normally. Even when folk got mad at God and said, why are you going to save our enemies? God said, I'm God, you ain't. I can do what I want to with my grace. I can love out who I want to with my love. God said, I can use your enemies to bless you or I can use your friends to bless you. That's my prerogative. That's what I do. There's nothing normal about how God operates in us and through us in the earth realm. And, and the second thing we said is that even though you go back and try to recreate, things will never be the same. Things can never be the same because you are not the same. The trauma changed you. And whether you want to believe it or not, I'm telling you, after you go through trauma, you change. There's no way around it. And what we can do is we can either use the trauma to grow from it or we can use the trauma to regress. We can use the trauma to move forward or we can move the, use the trauma to move back. Like sometimes we want to think that, uh, well, we'll just stay where we are. And, and we think we're staying where we are, but we're not. My father in the ministry used to say to us all the time, that which is not constantly being improved upon is slowly deteriorating. If you're not constantly moving forward, you are slowly slipping backward and you don't realize you're slipping backward until you're so far back that you wonder how I got there. How did I get this far back, this far depressed, this far anxious, this far angry? Because it happened little by little. And because it was so little that you didn't see the change in your demeanor from one day to the next. But if you looked at it from 10 years ago to now, there's a big change. So much so that when people who haven't seen you in years encounter you, they be like, man, something done changed about you. So there's just a couple of things I want to say today. And, um, be done. And I don't even think I have points today. I want to pick up from so verse 4 says early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus and he called out to them friends haven't you any fish and they said no and he said, throw your nets on the right side, and you'll have some. And when they did, they called, it, they called it a large uh, net of fish. And then John says to Peter, it's the Lord. Peter grabs his outer garment, wraps himself up, himself up, jumps in the water, and swims his way to Jesus. Um, let, let me just back up for one more second. I'm sorry. One other thing that, I, <clears throat> that says to me that they were trying to go back, I did say to you based on the names of those who they highlighted. <clears throat> they highlighted Simon Peter, um, Thomas, and Nathaniel. Then they said the sons of Zebedee, but they didn't call them by name. And then they said two other disciples. Peter, Simon Peter. Simon meaning righteousness, Peter meaning the rock. Nathan, um, Thomas, Thomas also called Didymus. Why do you have to put that in there? Didymus meaning the twin. And then Nathaniel, the one who I just described, who said, 
early in the ministry before he started following, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I, my, the reason why I believe that they were trying to go back and find normalcy as we often do is because the three that they highlighted and named, they, they gave both sides of their personality. Jesus had changed Simon's name to Peter. Peter means the rock, which means I'm stable. But John called him Simon Peter. <laughs> yeah, righteous is a good thing, but not when you're self-righteous. Uh, Thomas the twin, Thomas the twin. It, it's almost like Gemini the twin. Y'all know them Geminis. They got two personalities. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry if you're a Gemini up in here, up in here. But y'all know they got you. Well, you already know, Miss Thomas, don't you even? Thomas, who's the twin? It's like having two sides of yourself. And which one gonna show up today? Nathaniel, the one that doubted so that anything good could come out of Nazareth, now is seeking goodness and going back. And the reality is, is that after trauma, whatever, however far we have grown prior to the trauma, sometimes it gets erased in a matter of moments and we end up falling back into places and personalities that we thought we had outgrown and overcome. Okay, that part. So then when the disciple whom Jesus loves says to Peter, it's the Lord. Peter, he's so presumptuous. He's so uh, out there. It says he grabbed his outer garment, wrapped it about himself, jumped into the water and head to Jesus. And while the rest of them had to pull in the hall of the catch. In his haste to get to God, to get to Jesus, to get to Jesus in his trauma, he abandons his gift. Yeah, I'm, I'm walking a little heavy today, but it was heavy when God hit me with it. In our haste to get to God for healing, we run to God, we run to God, we run to God. God, fix it. God, help me, God. I take away the pain, God. Hey, hey, God, God, God. And because we've been exposed to bad theology for so long, we've begun to internalize it. As long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. It's theologically flawed. I get it. I understand what Vicky Winans is trying to do, and it's a catchy beat, and if somebody sing it, I'm going to sing along with them. I understand, but it's flawed theologically. And it has messed so many of us up to the point that we believe it. And so we run for Jesus to fix it. Whatever your it is. Fix my health. Fix my marriage. Fix my children. Fix my spouse. Fix my job. Fix it, God. Fix my attitude. Fix it, God. We're supposed to have grown in Christ by now. We're off of milk. We're on to meat. We've matured in our faith. And God looks at us and God says, well, what happened to the resources I gave you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, that's, how, that's how it was with me. He, he dropped. He, it was heavy. It was heavy. <laughs> We're running to God. God fix it and fix me. And God is saying, what happened to your resources? What happened to the gifts I gave you? What happened to the people I gave you? What happened to the friends I gave you? What happened to the children I gave you? The spouse I gave you? The job I gave you? What happened? God is saying, I knew you would need them. No man, no woman is an island unto themselves. You can't do this thing called life alone. And we've been lied to. 
and told that as long as we got Jesus, we don't need nobody else. You need Jesus and a therapist. Jesus and counseling. You need the vertical, but the, also the horizontal. Jesus did more than pray to God when he walked this earth. Jesus came, and when his, uh, when his public ministry started, the first thing he did was chose 12 friends. First thing. First thing was a support system. He was the son of God. So whether it's out of ignorance or impatience or, or eagerness, we forsake the gift, forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And, 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 and this part about needing Jesus and the therapist is so sad because the black church has really done a disservice to her people. Making people think if you go get counseling, you're crazy. Well, many of us, if you don't get counseling, you're crazy. First thing we're told when we get to seminary, you got a counselor? Especially if you're a pastor, do you have a counselor? How you dealing with everybody else's problems, sorting out everybody else's problems, carrying everybody else's load? Who carrying yours? Who? Watch this. It's evidenced by this. It says that they got on shore. And Peter, okay, I ain't even going to deal with Peter being naked out there. Peter, Peter just... Peter just Peter. He the packer. How you packing naked? But it's all good. But he was amongst friends. He was amongst friends. He said, my garment, it ain't, it ain't far. He close by. <laughs> it says that when Peter runs up there to Jesus going, fix it, Jesus, fix me. I miss you so. I'm so happy to see you. Oh, 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 oh. But we don't know the interchange between Peter and Jesus, but it says that when they landed, when the rest of them, verse 9, when the rest of the disciples landed, they saw a fire burning with some coal and fish already on it and some bread. Verse 10, what's the first thing Jesus said? Jesus said, bring me some of the fish you caught. Go get your gift. Go get your resource that you abandoned. Oh, come on, somebody. This, this got to be good to somebody other than me. Go get the folk you dropped along the way. Go get the people you turned your back on. Lied to. Go, go back and get those folk. Go get your resources. That I, watch this. Go get the resources I gave you. Even though Jesus had already started cooking, he said, bring me what you got. Which Jesus was saying, listen, y'all mature enough. I'm not fixing stuff for you just to be fixing it. You have resources. You have the ability. I have been with you three years. I have given you the Holy Ghost. I have empowered you and equipped you. And I have given you everything that you need. And yes, I am here with you as an option. And yes, I am one of your resources, but I ain't the only resource. I have given you other resources that I expect you to use. He said, bring some of what I have provided you. <laughs> How you say he provided? Because he told them, throw your net on the right side. The moment they threw their net on the right side of the boat, they caught in so many fish that they could barely pull them in. Peter jumps in the water, runs to Jesus in his haste, while the rest of them pull the catch onto the shore. And the first thing Jesus says when they get it there, go back and get it. How many of us is Jesus sending back? We sitting around waiting for him to fix it, but what he's waiting on is for us to get our resources. To use what he already gave us. To do what he's already said. 
And we are mad because we can't manipulate him to do the next thing for us because he's waiting on us to make a move in this thing, the right side. He says, go get what I provided you. Watch this, to feed you. To supply you, to provide sustenance for you. See, the resources that he gives, God didn't just give them just for naught. There's purpose in them. There's a feeding in them. There's a supply in them. And, and as we haste ourselves to our secret closets, to pray to God for God to fix it, heal it, do it, change it. God says, where are your resources? I, I have an issue with people who say God going to heal them, but they don't do what the doctor say. Well, well. <laughs> that, that doctor don't know nothing. I, I'm, 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 I'm trusting in the Lord. What? Well, who you think? Help the doctor get their education to be able to diagnose. But now, granted, you can ask questions, you can get engaged, you can do, but, but you ain't a doctor. If you got concerns, ask questions. Make them stay in there with you till you get all your questions answered. But don't tell me God going to heal you when you won't follow the instructions given you. A lot of us, when we report to Jesus for what we want, and he asks where the resources, we have to say, oh, you, oh, you meant that? Oh, I left that home. I, I didn't think I'd need that. Or I cussed that out weeks ago. I abandoned that a long time ago. This is why I tell couples when they get ready to get married, let me say this to you. Marriage ain't to make you happy, it's to make you holy. And I keep saying it throughout the counseling. I got a witness up in here. Say it throughout the counseling. Because that person is there to sharpen you and to shape you, and you likewise to them. But, but sometimes you're going to be like, now, hold up now. You ain't perfect. You ain't this. Trust me now. I been, I'm almost 26 years in this thing. And I'm just going to be like, okay. Wait, hold on. Hold up, Skippy. And it can, it can rub you the wrong way, make you mad, make you have an attitude. But then God going to be like, wait, hold up. Wait, what happened to the resource I gave you? Well, he got on my nerve, God. I was tired of him telling me how to fix me. He's so sensitive. It says, so Simon Peter, verse 11, climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish. Now watch this. It took all the rest of them, all of them to pull it to shore. But Simon Peter, being so strong, he was able to pull that net by himself. And, and he brought it to Jesus, and the net didn't tear. And it says, Jesus said, come have breakfast. The disciples dared not ask him who he was, for they knew who he was. This was the third time he had visited them after he had been raised. I'm done. What God wanted me to say this morning, don't let trauma cause us to abandon the gift. God says that I've given you stuff to help you work through trauma. I've given you people. I've given you skills. I've given you opportunity. And sometimes these things don't come back if we keep rejecting and abandoning them. So we have to learn to look with a spiritual eye. 
to see and understand what God is doing in the spiritual realm. So that trauma does not take you out nor take you down. But that you'll begin to see it for what it is. And begin to ask God, what are my lessons? What are my resources? Who are you sending me to? Because God doesn't want to leave us in trauma. And he doesn't. And I don't know what God is going to do next week, whether we stay here and get to the part about feeding my lambs or not. It depends on what God says. Because we're never left in trauma. God always brings us out. If Jesus, after experiencing, now, now Peter and the disciples only watched the trauma. Jesus bared the trauma. He felt every lash. He, he, he felt his skin ripped from his body. He, he felt the thorns being pressed into his brow. He felt the blood dripping down his face and body. He, he felt the nails being driven through his hands and his feet. He, he felt the pain when he pressed down on his feet and inhaled air to say seven things to the body. Before giving up his ghost. He felt it all. But even after his traumatic experience of Calvary. He came to use it. To equip, bless, and empower his disciples and us for the journey ahead. Now, what are you going to do with the resources he's given you to overcome your traumatic experiences? Let us stand. The doors of the church are open. Life after trauma. Yeah, we want to run to recreate what was. But it'll never be the same. We're tempted to go back and recreate it. And the more we try to, it won't feel the same. It won't be the same because it's not the same because after the experience, things change. But that's all right. The change can be good and new. All trauma does not have to lead to problems or our downfall or issue. A traumatic experience could be the springboard to our blessing. The, the trauma that you had to experience may be a blessing in, this, in disguise. And so the doors of the church are open. Jesus did it over 2,000 years ago. What I do is extend invitations. Is there anyone here this morning who doesn't know the Lord, never been saved, never said yes to his salvation? Never trusted him with your trauma. If you're here this morning and you know that you need to give it all to him, place it in his hand, let it go, give it up, I promise I'm not going to ask you about it. I'm going to shake your hand. Because everybody else in here that has taken the walk, has given their life, have done the same thing or at least tried, to do the same thing. Is there anyone in here who's never been saved but believe today is your day of salvation? I invite you to come. If you're here and you're looking for a church home and God has said, East Stonewall is the place I want you to be. That's the place I want you to work out your soul's salvation. That's the place I want you to connect. If you want to be a member of this church, if you want to join the fellowship, I invite you to come. If you're here in person, you can come. If you are on virtual, 
you can send us a message. Is there one here today who would like to be a member of East Stonewall Church? And if for any of these reasons you don't want to walk, but you want us to come to you or you want to talk with us after church, we are available as well. You may be seated. I would ask for the uh, stewards to come. It is our time for giving. We do have Giveify available, our Amplify app through the church. So you can bring your tithes and offerings. We'll ask that the ushers escort us starting from the rear of the church down the center aisle to bring your tithes and offerings. scan the QR code that is shown on the screen at this time. stand for the blessing of the offering. All things come of thee, O Lord.
Yes, he is. Life after trauma. Trauma is not the end ever of our lives nor our journey. God can turn trauma on its head. Look at what he did at Calvary or at the tomb. Not even trauma through and in death. For God can bring resurrection even when trauma brings us to the very brink of death. We just have to understand even in the temptation to go back that things will never be the same. But God is going to require that we use the gifts and resources that he's placed in our hands to feed us and to sustain us as we navigate the path of the traumatic experience. Now unto him who's able, able to keep us from falling and who can present us as spotless before the presence of his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.